president and founder of U.S. Advanced Computing Infrastructures and the founder of Chicago Quantum. Today we're going to talk about learning how to pick stocks and doing it with the help of a quantum annealing computer, in our case a D-Wave Systems 2041 qubit computer. And so you're going to learn how to pick stocks and build optimum stock portfolios based on using the underlying movement of the stocks. So you're not going to have to worry about what the professionals are saying or rely on emotion or, oh, I know that company. But take a look at how the stocks move with each other, and we're going to use that information to build it. And the graphic you see on the chart is something called the Sharpe Ratio, which was invented about 70 years ago. There was a Nobel um, Honorary Prize awarded to William Sharpe for that work. And we're showing how our quantum results show up right in that efficient frontier range. And so thank you very much for listening. So it's based on a paper, a paper um, a preprint in archive written by Jeffrey Cohen, Alex Kahn, and Clark Alexander. And so it's called Portfolio Optimization of 40 Stocks Using the D-Wave Quantum Annealer. We investigate the use of quantum computers for building a portfolio out of a universe of U.S. listed liquid equities that contains an optimal set of stocks. And so what we do is we're looking to balance risk versus return. And to do so, we have to reformulate the problem. So the Sharpe ratio, which we like, works great, but it doesn't work on a quantum computer. So we simplified it down to a Chicago quantum ratio, which is simpler and more conservative, but it still doesn't work on a quantum computer. And then we created a division problem, or a linear problem, called the Chicago quantum net score, and that does work on a quantum computer. So we took a 70 year old way to pick stocks and we reformulated it to run in a quantum computer. That's pretty exciting stuff and you can do it too. So you would click download to get the data, to get the paper. So I've already done that. Here's the paper. And we're going to walk through some key parts of it. So the first thing you should think about is the math. So financial portfolio optimization, the goal is to maximize your returns, so the profit you earn, while minimizing variability of the expected returns. And that variability of expected returns is considered risk. This is for a buy and hold strategy, and it's not for like day trading. This is more for a retirement account or a long-term buy and hold. And so we believe that investors can do better if they select the right combination of stocks and they hold them than if they just pick the recent winners or the hot picks or, uh, you know, what the latest uh, stockbroker might tell you to buy. So one of the challenges is how do you balance expected return and volatility. So the first thing we do is we show you how the Sharp Ratio works. And so the Sharp Ratio <clears throat> takes the weights of each stock times beta times the expected return of the market minus the risk-free return. And then of course you add back the risk-free return and you divide all that by the standard deviation of the portfolio. If you're still with me, let me try to say what that really means. So we take a group of stocks, and if they're in the portfolio, then we have the profit, and we divide it by the risk. And it's an expectation of that profit and that risk. I see this sometimes in my own 401k, where we'll look at last year's returns. And if the ratio is greater than 1, that's pretty good. So I earn 10%, I've got 10% risk. If it's over 2, that's great. I earn 20% return with 10% risk. And in our work, we saw sharp ratios in excess of 4. 
So you earn 40% returns with 10% risk. That's amazing. Doesn't happen all the time, but if you use a model like this and you have all the data at your fingertips, you can imagine, you know, calling someone up, hey, Bob, today's a great day to buy stocks. You take a look at what happened last year and there's, there's a lot of profit in the market and there's some patterns or some trends with some of these stocks we could take advantage of. So we had to simplify it, right? Now, beta is the ratio of the covariance of a portfolio with the market. So think of it this way. I've got a stock, let's say IBM, and it moves in lockstep with the market. That means over time, if the stock market goes up 1%, IBM goes up 1%. The stock market falls 1%, IBM falls 1%. It kind of follows the market. Not all stocks do that. So beta is based on how much the stock kind of amplifies the move. If it's a real hot, exciting stock, maybe it moves 2% for every 1% the market moves. And if it's like a boring stock, like a utility, maybe it only moves half of how much the market moves. So why do you want to look at things like the expected return of the market, the risk-free return? Do you really want to study the U.S. Treasury bill market? We had to look at 13-week treasuries. Do you really want to try to guess at what the stock market return next year is going to be? I don't know about you. I'm, I'm not good at guessing those things. Even beta is tricky because now I have to take that stock and, and move it with the whole market. Which market? So we simplify it down. The Chicago quantum ratio is based on the weights of each stock times the covariance of that stock against the index that you're choosing to use. In our case, we like the S&P 500. Most of the stocks we look at are in the S&P 500. So it's the covariance of that stock against the S&P 500 divided by the same risk factor as above, which is standard deviation of returns. So we've just simplified the whole thing. Chicago quantum ratio doesn't require any magic, any predictions of the future. We're just looking at market momentum. So here's the mathematical formulation of it. So if you were curious at how to find standard deviation, it's the weights of the stocks as, an, as a matrix transposed times the covariance of all the stocks against each other. This is where it gets complicated. If I've got 40 stocks, I've got a matrix with each stock against the other 39. And actually against itself is the variance of that stock times the weight matrix. Again, you take that whole thing and you take the square root of it. So by now, if you're still with me, that's great. Just know that we simplified things out so there's no Pocus, pocus. You don't have to guess at anything. So now, D wave needs a linear quadratic form. So if you're going to use a quantum computer, you can't have this division up top. You have to have a nice and linear subtraction problem. So the first thing we did is we said, let's take the sharp ratio and let's just try to take the log of the sharp ratio. Now, with logs, subtraction is just like division. So you could just subtract the log of the expected return minus the risk-free by the standard deviation. The problem is it doesn't work that way. It's a lot of mathematical problems. So we came up with our own formulation, which is new, which is called the Chicago quantum net score based on a factor of weights and an alpha term that we'll talk about later. You take the variance of the returns, the weighted portfolio, over the past year and you subtract your expectation of the returns raised to a certain power. So we just took, this is the first innovation by the way, we just took the sharp ratio and made a subtraction problem. Quantum computers don't divide but they do great addition and subtraction. Innovation number one right here. That model allows us to take an everyday problem of the Sharpe ratio or the Chicago quantum ratio, make it linear. Now, the second thing we had to do was validate that it worked. So as our, as Clark um, Alexander, who's got a PhD in mathematics, said, Jeff, you know, you did this empirically. 
You did it based on your intuition. And let's make sure that it actually works. And so we go through and empirically we show that it works. So here's a chart right up front. So we said, here's a sharp ratio. And that's an orange color to me. Here's the Chicago quantum ratio right there. And then here in blue is the Chicago quantum net score. <clears throat> so for this small sample, you see that the Chicago quantum net score is in the ballpark. It's on the conservative side, given this, this data set. So we felt good about it. Now you move to the next piece. So what did we do classically to solve the problem? So classically, of course, you do brute force. With, with uh, portfolio optimization, let's say for 16 assets, 20 assets, even up to 28 assets, we could just loop through all the answers, all the binary solutions. And we actually did it for 32 assets, but it took three days on my laptop. I don't have three days to buy stocks in the morning, but we, we did it just to show that we could. We actually tried to run 40 assets, but given the server that we have access to and our ability to multi-thread the server, uh, we just couldn't do it. It's 1.1 trillion portfolios. It just would just take too long. So 40 assets takes too long brute force. But... I like it because if we do brute force for 16 and then you do the D wave for 16 and you do the genetic algorithm for 16, you can actually compare all of your models and see that the D wave, the genetic algorithm, the matrix math, that all works perfectly and precisely. That gave us confidence to now scale to 40 assets. We ran a genetic algorithm. So I'll tell you a funny story. So one of our authors, Alex Kahn, teaches a summer school for high school kids. And he took, I think it was a 30-asset problem, and he wrote a genetic algorithm that came up with the right answer in like three seconds. So genetic algorithms are really powerful. They work. Okay, so let's talk about it. Our genetic algorithm, which is pretty basic, gets to a local minimum that's deeper than our Monte Carlo method after 950 million samples. So we could run a genetic algorithm for 30 seconds, and it does better than 950 million samples, which takes a few hours. So the challenge we have is there's a bit of optimization that goes on. You have to tune the parameters, things like, you know, how many generations? What's the probability of elitism? So how much mutation do I want? And what's the size of the initial population? And how do I even seed the initial population? But even just making some educated guesses, we got a better portfolio answer for one portfolio than we did out of the D-Wave. And it did that every time. So genetic algorithm beats D-Wave at this point. But that's okay. That's 40 assets. Random sampling. So we can go through and we can just sample. So what happens is we got 950 million. That's roughly 2 to the 29th portfolios out of a potential of 2 to the 40th. For those that like math, to go from 2 to the 29th to 2 to the 30th, you're doubling. And so we're talking about here doubling 11 times. So, you know, what we're doing is we're picking samples around the 40 assets plus or minus square root of 40 but we're only really testing less than one percent of the portfolios less than one percent in fact it's uh, it's it's quite a small number so by doing monte carlo and being smart with our samples we get a little bit of a lift but really we're not doing great after 900 i think the longest one we ran was um 850 million at one time and we came very close to the d-wave solution just took a very long time very frustrating for the team heuristic approach this is what i like so i grew up learning that stock picking has a lot of value and so i just proved it right so when you look at the best portfolios that show up in all of your different models whether it's d-wave random sampling genetic algorithms you find a couple stocks that stand out 
They show up all the time. Those are your all-stars. Now, if you turn the math on its head and you pick the worst performing portfolios, which we did, we find stocks that dominate the worst performing portfolios. It's the... Uh, you remember an old TV show, an old movie called The Bad News Bears, right? The players that are on The Bad News Bears, they're good players, right? But there were always some players that when they showed up, it was bad. So those are the dog stars. And so we could pick those out. And if you then take your all-stars and build a portfolio just of all-stars, you get a winning portfolio. And if you take all the dog stars you get a losing portfolio. So what we've realized is heuristically, and probably we can do this on the gate-based models, we can start to take chunks of portfolios, figure out who the all-stars are, put those together over and over and over again till we get 40, and then run those 40 on the D-wave and see how we do. So that's a heuristic approach that we're excited about. Simulated annealing as a Monte Carlo so we were able to do simulated annealing on half the problem. So we only did it for the minimizing the risk in the portfolio. We were not able at this point to do simulated annealing for the maximizing expected return. But it's our intent to have that for the next paper. And then we use an annealing quantum computer. So I'm going to take a break now. I want to thank you for listening. This is Chicago Quantum. This is Jeffrey Cohen speaking. I'm going to show you two things. One is, here's our logo. So if you want more information, just search on Chicago Quantum. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you our team. All three of us heavily involved. These are the authors. you got myself, Jeff Cohen, executive consultant. I've built and led very, very large IT infrastructure consultancies up to almost a half a billion dollars in sales. Um, I'm no physicist. I'm a, I'm a numbers guy. I love economics and finance. Then you have Clark Alexander, Dr. Alexander, um, mathematician, wrote a book on quantum computing, um, does data analytics as his day-to-day -day work. And then you have Alex Kahn, who's an IT management professional an IT executive, he's trained on quantum computing, and he's an amazing program manager, product and program manager. So the three of us bring together very different skill sets, and we've been able to solve the problem. So thank you very much for listening, um, and watch out for the next video. Thanks so much.